don't think that's going away. So um, for everyone that is already here in the Zoom meeting with us, my name is Katie and I am a librarian here at Lyon Township Public Library. And our speaker tonight is Valerie Marvin and she is the Capitol Historian of the capital of Michigan. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to give a little like introduction and some housekeeping information and then I'll turn it over to her. So um, I am happy to answer any library questions you may have at any time. So feel free to just shoot me a message. You can do it directly um, if you open up your chat and then click on my name. It's Katie Lyon Township Public Library. Um, I want to thank Valerie for joining us tonight and talking about E.E. E. Myers, a capital architect, and uh, we are recording um, this presentation, but it's only going to be up on our YouTube channel for a limited time. So um, Valerie graciously gave permission for us to uh, share it, but uh, for a limited time. Uh, there is no print out for the presentation, but um, I don't know if that's something that Valerie can share or not. It might have to do with copyright and permissions. Uh, I don't know, do you wanna say anything about that, Valerie? Um, I would be happy at the end if that person would, would like to talk about some more specific information that maybe they'd like a copy of, that would be fine. Um, but I don't have anything that I normally give out when I do this talk. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we'll be spotlighting our presenter, but feel welcome to keep your video off. Um, you're also welcome to turn it on, but if there's anything disruptive, I will turn your video off. We don't want it um, to be a little too distracting or anything like that. I'm also going to keep everyone muted. Uh, please use the raise your hand function. And where you find that is at the bottom. There's like little um, icons down there. If you if you see the one um, that has like the three dots, uh, or if you see the little reaction button, if you click on that, that's where you find the raise your hand function. And um, so that'll have a little blue hand that pops up lets so us know that you have a question. And then to get rid of it, you just do the same thing. You just click on that. Uh, and if you have any questions at all, feel free to also put them in the chat. I don't think we have any anyone calling in on the phone, but that's also welcome and we will um, allow you to ask questions. And um, if there's anything disruptive during the meeting at all, whether through sound or video, it may result in your dismissal. So I'm just letting you know this ahead of time because we wanna make sure everyone can enjoy this shared event. Uh, in a comfortable and safe online environment. So I will be monitoring the chat and your video. And if for some reasons um, you become unmuted, I'll take care of that. So you may see that happen. Uh, next, I wanna invite you to participate in our upcoming virtual event next Wednesday. Um, we will be having uh, Faded Glory, Saving Michigan Civil War Battle Flags on Wednesday, February 24th at 6.30 p.m. So if you do wanna join us for that Zoom presentation, um, you just go to our website at l2pl.org and find February 24th and just register like you did for this uh, presentation tonight. And lastly, uh, we welcome your feedback. If you don't mind in the form of a short survey or share your experience with us, uh, with this uh, presentation tonight. And any ideas or topics for future events you'd be interested in attending. Uh, we appreciate everything that you shared with us and we take it into consideration when planning future programs. So I will include the survey link in the chat for you to access throughout this presentation at your leisure. Um, but if you don't do it in time and we end the meeting and it disappears, it is on our event calendar at the very bottom. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Valerie. Thank you so much, Katie. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint to show tonight, which hopefully I can get to go to full slide mode. There we go. 
All right, well, welcome everyone tonight. Thank you very much for the introduction, Katie. Um, tonight I'm gonna be talking about E.E. E. Myers or Elijah Myers, the architect of Michigan's capital, who at one point in time was known as America's greatest capital architect. But the truth is, not too many of us know much about him now. So today we're gonna kind of take a look at his career, take a look at his life and see um, what buildings uh, that he designed survive and uh, talk also a little bit about why we've lost some of them over time. When we talk about Elijah Myers, um, Elijah Myers was a 19th century man. He was a Victorian. Um, if some have argued that he was the embodiment, for better or for worse, of the Gilded Age, as we call that brash, headstrong, fast-moving, exuberant period following the American Civil War. Meyer's fame was such that when he died on March 5th of 1909, um, he noted an obituary in the New York Times. So he was definitely a national figure. He was a name that people knew across the country and certainly in architecture circles. Here we can see the clipping that ran in the next day's Times. Elijah E. Myers, known as an architect and the designer of a number of state capitals and public buildings, died this afternoon in his home in this city. This is, of course, from Detroit. He was born in Philadelphia in 1832. Colonel Myers designed the state capitals of Michigan, Texas, Colorado, Idaho, and Utah, and the parliament buildings at Rio de Janeiro, at Rio Janeiro Brazil. He was a member of the Board of Examiners of the World's Fair Buildings in Chicago in 1893. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that's a bad obituary. However, I can tell you as a historian, this obituary has caused me endless hours of consternation. And as of yet, a lot of unsatisfied searching because while these claims and statements are often made about Myers, historians have yet to be able to prove that they are all true. And a lot of this uncertainty hinges on the fact that there is no family papers that survive. There are no direct descendants of Mr. Myers that survived. And even during his own lifetime, he was very good at obscuring facts and embroidering things, one might say, to the point where sometimes it is hard to know what one can take as truth coming from his own lips. But of course, this is part of what also makes him a, a fascinating and appealing enigma to, to historians. So I wanna to try to dig into this. We're not gonna deal with every one of these buildings tonight. Spoiler alert, I have not figured out if he actually designed anything in Brazil or not. Um, maybe someday, you know, I'll get to take a sabbatical and, and get you know, the all expenses paid research trip to Brazil. Highly unlikely, sounds nice. Um, but we will talk about his capitals, which by the way, there's also some confusion here. As his obituary says, he designed five capitals. However, at the time of his death, only four were built and only four would ever be built. One, Utah, was never constructed. And of those four buildings constructed during his lifetime, only three still stand. This gives you just a taste of some of the complications that surround him. Now those three capitals are where he is best remembered today. And this is where I first encountered him 16 years ago when I started working at the Michigan State Capitol. The three Capitol buildings that stand that Elijah Myers designed are the capitals of Michigan, Texas, and Colorado. And these are the buildings where his legacy, where his memory is best preserved. And if you Google him on the internet, that's the first thing that you'll find. But while it is very glamorous and admirable to be a capital architect, and of course one could be this in the Gilded Age because this was a time when America was building state capitals uh, uh, very quickly left and right as many states really matured, came into their own, and quite frankly had the money to build large grand buildings. Still though, this leaves us wondering, who was this man? Who was this man that got all of these high profile commissions who warranted an obituary in the New York Times, but who has in many cases, also outside of those capitals, fallen into obscurity. 
Well, we know what Mr. Myers looked like. There are four or five images of him that do survive. And this is, to be frank, um, my favorite. This is an image actually that dates to his work in the 1870s on the Michigan State Capitol. So this, um, this image is a critical piece of the storytelling in our Capitol building. And it, it allows us to, to imagine him, to sort of conjure him up in our minds. But of course, like anyone, he did not appear fully formed. Elijah Myers was a baby. He was born in, depending on which source you choose to believe, 1828, 1829, 1830, or 1832. Isn't genealogy fun? Born in Frankfurt, which at the time was not part of Philadelphia, though today it is. Today, Frankfurt is a, a borough within the city of Philadelphia. He was born to um, a relatively comfortable middle-class family. Um, his father was a farmer. His mother um, came from a family that actually owned a tavern. And in fact, this was the reason that her father could not join the local Baptist church because he sold alcohol. <laughs> her name was Mary Haynes. And she married Myers as a young woman when they were both still youth in Philadelphia or in Frankfurt as it was originally. Now, this is in an era when the East Coast is still really the, the center of American commerce and American architecture and building, but that is going to change during Meyer's lifetime. Philadelphia, of course, is also, ironically, America's first capital city. And in some ways, it seems incredibly fitting that this is the place where Myers is born. And of course, he is born into a world that is really on this side of the ocean, just starting to get into the throes of the Industrial Revolution and the effects of the revolution, the um, large numbers of immigrants who will come to America in this period, hoping to achieve the American dream. These immigrants will build his buildings. We are traveling in this time, really for the first time in America, on railroads. Here you can see an early railroad line. Those railroads will carry Myers across the country to his commissions, north, south, east, and west. Even the very materials that are being manufactured in America, such as iron, these are the materials that he will use to design his buildings. He is very much a man of his era. That being said, we do not know a great deal about his youth. There were a few biographical sketches that were uh, published at various points in his life. Some of them are what one might call Victorian puff pieces. Um, some of them are probably pretty accurate, but they often just lead us to more questions. So for example, one piece tells us that he is a young man, he studied at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Now today, the Franklin Institute is a hands-on science museum. In the 19th century, it was a sort of a technical school. And this speaks to the fact also that as Myers is growing up, um, American education looks very different than it does today. He did go to the local schools in Philadelphia. Um, we do believe he graduated from Philadelphia High School as it was then and went to the Franklin Institute, but he did not go to college in a modern sense because there were no colleges or universities in America teaching architecture yet in the 1840s and 50s. So he learned through the trades. Various sources tell us that he trained as a carpenter and as a mason and eventually was able to apprentice himself with a practicing architect. We think he probably worked for Samuel Sloan, who was very well respected on the East Coast, um, best known for designing schools and, and hospitals. Um, Sloan, we don't have, so some of the evidence that puts the two men together is circumstantial. We don't have that smoking gun yet that says, yes, we know that right here on this register of staff in Samuel Sloan's office, there's Elijah Meyer's name. But we do know that Myers used Sloan as a reference. And we know that Sloan would vouch for him very early on in his architectural career. So there appears to have been definitely 
some sort of studer, student and mentor relationship. And the truth is, this is simply how one became an architect. One apprenticed with another architect, and when one was ready, one put out one shingle and did one's thing. There was no formal process yet in this country, which, is, <laughs> which speaks to the fact that this is, by modern standards, a bit of the Wild West. Not, of course, geographically speaking, but you know, today we, we talk a lot about building codes and regulations, and we want to make sure that our architects are certified and know what they're doing and are well-educated. Back in the 19th century, you just kind of had to trust them. Now, we do know that Sloan and Myers both were very good at promoting their businesses. And we have to remember, for men of this era, architecture was not something that one did as part of a huge firm. Um, today, at the Capitol, I have worked with architects on a number of projects, and I am always very intrigued to see how a modern architect operates and how their firms are set up. Um, I will tell you, I have come to come to realize that there are some similarities with what I think was going on in the 19th century, but there are also a lot of differences. Um, Meyer's firm was always very small, and he was always at the top of it. And he was, yes, a designer, but he was first and foremost a salesman. And I think this is something he learned from Sloan. And of course, this is an era associated with great self-promotion. And one way to do that is to print these volumes of model designs. They start to really become a thing in America in the 1840s when um, Andrew Jackson Downing and uh, um, AJ Davis, or Davis and Downing, um, a landscape architect and a builder were working together to start to produce some of the first home plan books in America. And these were pretty modest. You know, they give you a, a floor plan, they give you a, a nice facade, um, and that's about it. And the idea was that you would take this to a local builder who would then um, determine if, if it was something they could construct for you. And these were all over in the market in both the antebellum and the post-Civil War period. But Myers he doesn't want to work in the East Coast. He doesn't want to be sitting next to Sloan or in Sloan's firm the rest of his life. He wants to do what every ambitious young American man was told to do by Horace Greeley in the 19th century. He wants to go west. So the young man and his wife pick up and they move westward to Springfield, Illinois, which is where Myers sets up his first independent shop, if you will. He moves during the Civil War, 1862, 1863. Now, if you remember his obituary, he is called Colonel Myers. There are some suggestions that he did some work for the US government actually designing barracks for soldiers during the Civil War. It is possible that he was given the, turn, the title Colonel as sort of a, an honorific in thanks for that work. There is no suggestion, however, that he ever actually picked up a gun and fought. So he, he gave his service to the Union in other ways. And he very quickly set about making himself uh, well-known in Springfield circles. An architect, of course, who wants to design buildings needs to become acquainted with the people who can afford to commission them. And very quickly, within the first few years, Meyer starts to pick up two significant clientele. The first is in the private sphere. He remodels a hotel, he builds a bank. Um, these are, are very common, uh, common uh, jobs for an architect working in any moderately sized downtown. He also very quickly starts to chase public commissions. Now one is never going to get rich on public commissions, but one does get one's name in the newspaper a lot with them. So they are very good for publicity. And then there are the buildings that are somewhere in the middle, like the Springfield Home for the Friendless, which we believe was his first standalone building working under his own name. The Springfield Home for the Friendless um, was a, a sort of um, shelter, if you will, um, an, an orphanage, they would have said, in the 19th century, although not by our definition. The Springfield Home for the Friendless 
was operated for women and children um, who could not support themselves. Because in the 19th century, if one lost one's father, who was in most states the only legal guardian of a, ch of a child, one was considered an orphan, even if one's mother was alive and well. And of course, places like the Springfield Home for the Friendless um, saw their tenancy rates go up during the Civil War as thousands upon thousands of men gave their lives fighting. Now, within a few years, Myers is designing very large mansions in the Springfield area. Um, there is one, the Brinkerhoff home that still survives as of last I knew. I visited it about a dozen years ago now. Uh, it was actually owned by a college. And these are homes that have uh, 13, 15 rooms in them, substantial brick homes that cost $30,000, $40,000 in the 1860s to build. That is remarkable. And we can see that Myers is really moving in the right Springfield circles, both through his commissions, which are putting him in touch with the power men and women of the city, the movers and shakers, and also via the fact that in 1865, as a Springfield resident who's only lived there, remember, two, three years, he is asked to serve on the committee that actually plans President Lincoln's funeral in Springfield. Here we can see an image of the second Illinois state capital, or excuse me, the, the previous Illinois state capital. I forget how many there have been in the state, but I want to say there's four or five. So this is the previous Illinois state capital. Um, Meyer's office was actually right across from the street from it at one point in time, above Chatterton's jewelry store. We don't think that Myers ever met Lincoln. There's no good juncture point for them in history because Lincoln, of course, left Springfield in early 1861 for his March inauguration and never returned to the city until his remains were brought back following his assassination. We do not see Myers ever going to Washington in this period. So it is, I believe, extremely unlikely that the two men ever met. But still, Myers is considered a part of Springfield, a part of the inner circle of power so that he serves as part of the committee that plans Lincoln's funeral and also escorts his remains to the cemetery where he is buried. This puts him at a very, very important moment in American history. And interestingly, his main duty was to drape the Capitol in mourning, to decorate it. And as, of course, this is the Victorian period, we decorated for deep mourning following the passing of Lincoln. And you can see his workmanship in this somber, somber image. Now, within a couple years, Myers gets his first commission for a courthouse. Now I mentioned he, he, was, um, he would often pursue public projects. He starts off small. He starts off designing a couple jails and sheriff's residences, which were attached at that time. And these are very small jails in rural communities. We're talking four, six, eight cells in them maybe. However, in the late 1860s, he gets his first courthouse commission. And this is really a step up in, on the architectural ladder. The courthouse is for Macoupin County in Carlinville, Illinois. Well, it's a small town still to this day. It is about a 45 minute drive southwest of Springfield um, in a modern automobile on modern roads. The building is beautiful. I had a chance to visit it a few years ago when I was in Illinois attempting to chase Elijah Myers and his records. However, it's also infamous, might be the right word, notorious. If you go to Carlinville to this day, and if you are clearly a stranger and you start to poke around downtown and start to look around the courthouse, inevitably someone will stop and tell you the story of the million dollar courthouse. Yes, you heard that right. This building constructed in the late 1860s cost one million dollars to build. Now, there's obviously a story here. 
In fact, when Myers got the commission to design this building about 1867 or so, he told them it would cost 50 to $100,000. That's a lot less than a million. Was Myers selling them a story? Maybe. But to be frank, as much as I am past the point of ever believing Elijah Myers to be an innocent human being, I do not believe that the fault was all his. I think he was perhaps naive. He had never designed a building of this scale. I think he underestimated the cost of products, including stone, iron, brick. But I also think that most of the fault for the ridiculous cost overruns had something to do with the Board of Commissioners <laughs> and the local judge. In fact, that local judge, who was part of the building commission, built across the square at the same time a hotel, here you'll see it as the St. George, using the exact same materials that went into the courthouse. The treasurer, the county treasurer, who was also on the board of building commissioners, actually skipped town, mysteriously disappeared before the project was open. Clearly, there were some chaotic things going on behind the scene. And to be frank, the people of Carlinville and McCoupin County did not burn the last bond on this building until after Elijah Myers died if my memory serves me correctly. It is still an amazing building and it is still a notorious building. <laughs> and this is how Myers starts his public career. It is amazing to me that he comes out of it unscathed. Now at the same time, the dust is starting to settle in Carlinville from this million dollar courthouse. Michigan has decided that it is going to build a new capital. At the time, we were using this building that you'll see on the screen. This, our second state capitol, was a two-story wooden building that had been erected in Lansing initially in the 1840s. In 1847, the state legislature flummoxed everyone when they voted to move the capital from Detroit, our biggest city, to Lansing Township, which it was said had a booming population of eight registered voters. Now, when state officials start to come up to Lansing, Lansing Township, there is no city of Lansing officially until 1859, 12 years later. They very quickly pick up two pieces of land, one for the capital they can afford to build right now, which is what you see on the screen, actually even smaller than that. This is with the addition. Two, that second piece of land is for the big capital they hope to build someday, but someday is still far into the future. We erect the original portion of this building in 1847, move into 1848 and government will function using this building and another office building built just down the street until 1878. So that is what a temporary capital meant in 19th century um, government speak, if you will. It was literally in use for 30 years, but we always intended to replace it. However, first we needed to get our legal and financial ducks in a row as a state. And of course, in the meantime, we are, as with the rest of the country, distracted in the 1860s by the Civil War. Michigan, as you will hear, I suspect next week, if I remember correctly, I think one of my colleagues at the Capitol is giving the presentation next week, which I highly recommend. Those battle flags were awesome. Um, as you will hear, if you attend that presentation, Michigan sent 25% of her male population to fight. In fact, if you look at the statistics for men who were of fighting age, one out of every two Michigan men fought in the Civil War. Though there were, of course, no battles fought this far north, Michigan was dramatically impacted by the war, including in state government. And so it is not until the early 1870s that we can return to our conversation about erecting a new capital. And in 1871, Governor Baldwin, puts his foot down and says, the time has come. We've been talking about this for decades. We need to do it. So in 1871, the State Board of Building Commissioners sends out a circular asking for architects to submit plans. And one of those architects, of course, is none other than Elijah Myers, 
who will submit a plan that he entitles tuabor. That is, of course, tuabor, a familiar Latin word um, to many of us. Tuabor means we will defend or we will protect. It is, is appears on the small shield that is part of our coat of arms. And it is a, a rallying cry that we have used in Michigan for, for uh, nigh on um, almost two centuries at this point in time. So clearly Myers did his homework. He wanted to design a capital. He knew that this would really put him um, in a small select circle of architects who were designing at this level. Now he already had a second courthouse going in Illinois by this point in time. But when he submits his design for Michigan's building, um, he's, he's not just focusing on us. He is actually at the same time talking about submitting plans for a capital in Connecticut. That um, commission will go to, uh, I believe that's an Upjohn building. Um, but in December of 1872, when the final plans are submitted, the Board of Commissioners start to open them. Uh, there are 20 that come in. And by January 24th, they are publicly announcing that Michigan's new capital will be designed by none other than E.E. E. Myers of Springfield, Illinois. But not of Springfield, Illinois for much longer. Um, this commission will inspire Myers to move with his family to Michigan, but not to Lansing. He will move to Detroit where he will spend the rest of his life. Um, this is in large part because frankly, Lansing was not of the size to be able to support an architect like Myers. And we do not have very good railroad connections in this city. So if he wants to continue to work in Illinois, to, con to continue to build his career across the country, he needs to be in a place that is a good railroad hub. And in Michigan, that of course is Detroit. Now, why does Myers get this commission? Well, there are a few different, a few different theories to this. Uh, first of all, to be blunt, <laughs> we believed we could afford Myers building. Clearly, we had not heard the stories of what had happened in Carlinville. <laughs> um, we wanted a building that was elegant, but we wanted a building we could afford. And some of the plans that were proposed and submitted to us were far too elaborate and far too large for our million, million point two budget. We also though wanted a building that could inspire. And in this period, particularly in the North, we wanted a capital with a dome. Capital domes were very much of the moment at this time, in large part because during the Civil War, the national capital received its large dome. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the famous photos of Lincoln's inauguration with the dome, of this cavernous hole behind him. Starting in the 1850s and going through the Civil War, the national capital was dramatically remodeled and enlarged. And Lincoln very famously refused to halt construction of the project during the war. He said, we must continue to show that the union will continue that we will have a nation that will use this building as its capital. Here you can see an image of that dome uh, built up just to the drum level where the colonnade is. Myers understood the new significance of this dome. This, this went very deep into the hearts of many Americans, particularly the fighting men who had spent time in Washington during the war. Many Union soldiers were furloughed or um, were sent to DC to be uh, nursed for injuries during the war. And then as now, the capital was a tourist destination in addition to being a hospital and, and many other things. And so the men came to see this dome as a symbol of the union that they were fighting to save and to rid of slavery. That dome became a symbol of American democracy. And Myers, unintended, capitalizes on this notion. He is one of the first architects to put big, tall, lofty domes on his capitals. And this is one reason he becomes a success. He also though has to design buildings that are practical, just as form is very important when it comes to public buildings in the Victorian period, so is of course function. 
that wooden capital had not functioned properly for us for a very long time. Myers designs a, the building on what was, uh, what's called a cruciform plan. So basically a big X, like a big cross. And he zones the building um, both by floor and also by wing for the different functions of government. So historically speaking, the executive departments, so we're talking the state treasurer, the secretary of state, the, um, the state land commission, the state railroad commission, the board of health, the superintendent of public instruction, the auditor general, the adjutant general, their offices were on the first floor. And when they outgrew those offices, they moved into the spaces directly below on the ground floor. The second floor was home in the east wing. So that's the front here. Um, this was where the governor's office was located. In the north wing, we had the house chamber on the floor level, the senate chamber on the south, and in the west wing on the second, third, and fourth floors was the old state library. Now the house and the senate chambers were also, also multi-level. Um, they continued up into the third story, which is where the public galleries or balconies are located. And then the, the east wing of the third floor was home to the state Supreme Court. So at this point in time, once this building is finished in 1879, this building will briefly house all of government. It was designed to be the center of state government, the, the very seat of government and of authority. To be fair, we designed it for our government as it was largely in the 1870s when Michigan had just reached a million people for the first time. Within 20 years, this building would be packed. We had people working in every last corner they could find and we were scrambling for space elsewhere. Ultimately, Michigan would top out at about 10 million people. And as our population grew, government grew and evolved with it. And so there's a long history of additional office spaces being needed, but that's another story for another night. I wanna share with you some images that were taken actually during the construction of our Capitol building. Work started with digging the foundations in 1872 and continued over the next six years. Here you can see the stone starting to go up. This, the facade of the building is stone. It's um, Berea sandstone quarried in Amherst, Ohio region. So kind of Cleveland-ish, Northeast Ohio. Um, probably the, the best known local landmark today that's close to the quarry is the Cedar Point. Um, the interior walls are all made of brick. Depending on which source you choose to believe, there are 15, 17, or 19 locally Michigan-made bricks in the building. And then um, the dome on top is all made of iron and sheet metal. And this also came from out of state. Sometimes people get a little unhappy when they realize that our building is not made of all Michigan products. Well, to be fair, you could not get all of these products in Michigan in the late 19th century. For example, we have sandstone in the state, but the quality is not that good. The best stone was to be found in the Berea Formation in Ohio. So that's what we procured. When it came time to, to commission the, the dome in its thousands of pieces, there were no iron foundries in Michigan that could do this kind of work. So the contract for that iron went to a Philadelphia firm, the S.J. Creswell Company. And it was such a big deal. Mr. Creswell actually came out on the train to Lansing himself to oversee the dome's construction. And just that piece of the building took over a year to assemble. You can see here, um, there's the drum. So this is our colonnade, thinking again about that national capital. One thing that makes Michigan's dome a little bit different it is it is a bit narrower than you see in some states and in Washington, DC. Um, this helps give the illusion that the building is actually much taller than it is. Here you can see finally in 1879, 1880, the finished capital, a monument, for the ages, or as one publication called it, the new lion of Lansing. Now this building was a huge success for Elijah Myers. This really put him on the map. The building, unlike the courthouse in Carlinville, um, was built almost on budget. It was supposed to cost 1.2 million, ended up costing 1.4. We were okay with that. The building commission had approved all of those changes along the way. 
It was also, particularly for the Golden Age, Gelded Age, a remarkably scandal-free project. Everybody watched this really close and it was done properly. And this won us praise from the press and from um, architecture watchers across the country. Myers did this right, and this put Myers in a really good position. Now, at the same time he is building this building in the 1870s, he is also getting commissions left and right elsewhere in Michigan. This decade is when he will build his only identified Michigan courthouse, the old county courthouse, ironically in Marshall, Michigan, today known for preservation, um, which was actually torn down several decades ago. The old Eastern Michigan Insane Asylum, as they called it originally. Um, this asylum was the second erected in the state. Uh, Kalamazoo came first, then Pontiac, um, then Ionia and Traverse City. So this is also part of the Victorian expansion of state services and state institutions. We're building mental hospitals, we're building schools and universities and, and prisons. This is all part of that population growth and the growth of government that goes with it. Myers did an addition to the state prison in Jackson in the 1870s. He built a high school in downtown Lansing, just about three blocks from the Capitol building. This lovely Second Empire or um, uh, General Grant style building as they called it then uh, with its mansard roof. He designed several churches across the state, um, including the First Baptist Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He did Harper Hospital in Detroit in the 1880s, uh, one of his best known commissions in his new hometown. And also in the 1880s, he designed the lovely Grand Rapids City Hall, which you can see here, as with the rest of these, um, was a, a popular subject for postcards that people would send, um, both as, as travelers, but also simply as a communication tool. And when you think about it, while his name was not on every single postcard, every single postcard still in some ways promoted the work of Elijah Myers. His buildings were recognizable, they were beautiful, they were admired, and particularly the public buildings, they belonged to us. We as Michigan citizens had a stake in them. And this is, this is really exemplified by the point that in the 1870s, there are Michigan newspapers who are talking about Myers as the state architect. Now, there was no such title in state government at the time, but this is the position that he occupies in our mental, um, th this is sort of the, uh, the position he has in our collective subconscious, if you will, in Michigan in the 1870s and early 1880s. But of course, there's still nothing like a capital. Now, as I said, we tend to remember him best in his capitals. And sometimes it's hard to always know how to tie him to these other buildings. As I've already hinted, several of his Michigan buildings are gone. Some are partially gone, as is true of the First Presbyterian Church in um, Albion, which Myers kind of designed in the 1870s. Um, the third church, if you will, um, was only stood for a few years, actually. It was constructed over a period of about six years from 1873 to 1879. Um, churches tend to be built rather slowly because they are often uh, um, pay-as-you-go projects for congregations who are reluctant to go into debt. Um, this building, though, was officially dedicated in 1879, same year as our current capital but it burned in 1883. And reports from the time and images suggest that portions of the exterior, the exterior brick walls and part of the steeple survived and they began rebuilding soon after. So is this an Elijah Myers building? Mostly. <laughs> um, did they necessarily stick to all of his plans when they rebuilt? We don't know. We don't know. This church is still today considered to be a Myers build, but of course it has been rebuilt over the years and many of his buildings have been added onto and modified. 
one building that we know we've lost is the home Myers designed for himself. Uh, he was doing so well that by about 1882-83, he decides to build himself a new, completely over-the-top, Victorian Gothic stick style, you name it, mansion in Detroit. It was, by my line of thinking at least, as you can tell, I'm a fan of Victorian architecture, it was amazing. Uh, this image of it ran in the August 1883 issue of the Inland Architect and Builder, which was an architectural trade journal published in Chicago. What I wouldn't give to be able to go back to Detroit in 1883 and see this house myself. Um, you can tell looking at the outside that this was a polychromatic brick building, um, maybe had stone window hoods. There's some lovely uh, woodwork you can see um, in, the, uh, in the gables, probably a slate roof, again, at least two colors, if not more, beautiful cresting. You can see finials coming off the towers. This house had it all. This tells you how well Elijah Myers was doing by the early 1880s. According to census records, he lived in this home with his wife, Mary, and with their surviving adult, their, their surviving children. Um, four of his five children would survive to adulthood. Maggie, their firstborn, Margaret, um, did not make it. She actually was born in Philadelphia and is buried there with her grandparents. George, Julia and Mary were born in Springfield. So they made the move to Detroit with mom and dad in 1872. And Florence was actually born in Detroit. So she was the native Michigander or Michiganian of the family, whichever you prefer. They lived, um, George, Julia, Mary, Florence, Elijah, and Mary, the mother, um, lived in this home with a couple of, at least one live-in servant, if memory serves me correct. Um, for many years. And this was clearly by this point in time, they had arrived professionally and also socially. The Myers were socializing with the top of Detroit society, which of course was in part in acknowledgement of Myers' position, certainly his position as the capital's architect in Michigan helps, but also Myers, it was always important to Myers professionally to be able to at that upper echelon of society because, again, these were the people who owned businesses, who sat on boards, who could commission his buildings, which were never cheap. Now, he tried for a lot more buildings than he actually got. Of course, this is true of every architect. And keep in mind, with these public buildings, he is submitting designs just purely on his own time and dime. Um, he is submitting designs into public competitions. Now these competitions, particularly for capitals, were very high profile and there was a lot of press coverage. And one of my favorite Meyer stories actually comes from a visit he made to Georgia in the early 1880s to submit plans unsuccessfully for the Georgia State Capitol. A newspaper reporter finds him in a local hotel where he's staying for a few days. And this reporter in true Victorian fashion um, gives us the best description of Myers. Now, as I said, we do have a handful of photographs of him that survive, but he, de he describes how he was dressed in a faultless black. He describes you know, his hair and, and, and um, the, the cut of his coat. And he makes sure to point out that on his breast and his cravat sparkles a diamond stick pin. Mr. Myers was not known for his subtlety to say the least. And in 1882, why be subtle? In 1882, he gets probably the most well-publicized commission of his life when he is hired by the state of Texas to design the new Texas state capitol. I will argue to my dying day that the Michigan building is his greatest success and that he saw the building to fruition and the building was forever held up as a model of a successful Gilded Age project. However, the second he got the commission for Texas, this building stayed on his letterhead for the rest of his life. Because it's Texas, of course, they had to have a bigger capital than Michigan. This building is 
seven or nine feet, depending on which source you believe, taller than the national capital in Washington, DC. It is huge. This was the commission that really put Myers over the top. The only trouble is that construction didn't go quite as well as it did in Michigan, in part because Myers did not move to Austin or Houston or Dallas or anywhere in the state of Texas. He continued to build in Michigan, in Illinois. By this point in time, he is building in many states across the country, and he is commuting to Austin. The trains do not run fast enough. And soon it becomes a battle of egos. The egos of the State Building Commission, who are getting increasingly frustrated by the fact that Myers is not coming when they ask him to, is not responding to their letters and telegrams in proper haste. And Myers, who says, well, I'm the architect, they can't do anything without me. Well, eventually they proved they could. Myers was fired from this building project four years in. In 1886, he is told that his services are no longer needed. And he threatens to sue. Um, I don't know how far he got in that process. Uh, Myers <laughs> could be rather litigious when he wanted to, but still, when the dust settles, when the building opens in 1888, he is not invited to the dedication, but still they say it is the Texas State Capitol designed by Elijah Myers. And he continues to keep it on his letterhead. So he continues to take credit for it, perhaps as he should have for the rest of his life. But this marks the beginning of a new problem that is emerging for Myers. Myers thinks he can do more than he can. And this is going to start to become more and more serious. In the 1880s, he also gets his next capital commission, but this is not for a state capital. This is not going to be for a big, huge building with a dome on top. This is for a territorial capital in Idaho, which is a lovely building, very different from his other buildings, more of a Richardsonian Romanesque style. And this building is not going to warrant as much attention as the Texas building does. Now, at the time he died, um, there was thought that this, I forget if Idaho had become a state yet. I think they had. Um, this had become a state capital, but it would be replaced by the current Idaho state capital that was built late 19 teens, early 1920s. Um, so this building no longer stands. So remember I said there were five capitals he designed of which were built, well, this, is, this gets us down to three now because it was demolished in the early 20th century. Now, he is also doing a lot of work in the Midwest still. So he is designing courthouses, a courthouse in um, Lorain County in Elyria, Ohio, actually not too far from the sandstone quarries. He designs a very similar courthouse, basically on the same plan, which they know about and are okay with, in Grant County, um, Indiana. Uh, Marion is the county seat there. These are twins, if you will. He designs a courthouse in Galesburg, Illinois. Now this looks nothing like his other courthouses. This again is more of that Victorian Gothic meets Richardsonian Romanesque. Um, this is a style he will move into more in the 18, later, latter part of the 1880s. And this is something also that makes it a little hard to track Elijah Myers. Um, unlike some architects like H.H. H. Richardson, hence the term Richardsonian, Romanesque, Myers is not associated with one particular style. Quite frankly, he dabbled in a lot of styles over the years, and I think this was in part because he wanted to keep pace with the competition. So you cannot look, or at least if you can, you're better than I am, um, I cannot look at a building and right away say, oh, yep, yeah, that's Elijah Myers because it has A, B, and C. Also, um, he designs a series, as I alluded to earlier, of college buildings. Um, this is Alumni Hall at Max College, which is literally across the street from the Max County Courthouse. A nice pairing again there. Um, he will also design buildings at, um, he will do some work on a hospital at the University of Michigan in the 1870s. He will design um, two faculty homes on the president's, the old president's house, Matt Cowles, at MSU or MAC in the 1870s. Um, Again, these are in large part public colleges. Now, I think Knox may be private, um, but these are schools that are growing their campuses. 
Um, they are receiving increasing amounts of funding in the late 19th century, their student populations are growing, and so they are need to commission new buildings. And Myers is the happy recipient of several of those contracts. That is not to say though that every job goes well. Um, there are some black spots outside of Texas. For example, the Douglas County Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska is built using faulty materials and part of the building collapses as it is being constructed. Now, how much of this can we blame on Myers? That's an excellent question and I can't answer it um, to the extent I, would, I wish I could. I don't think everything was his fault because in most cases, he was not at these building sites all that often. He was the architect. He was not the superintendent of construction. On the other hand, were his designs always perfect? Maybe not. You have to remember again, this man, at risk of sounding rude, is, is he is not an engineer. He is not an architect in the modern sense. And as buildings are growing and changing and evolving very quickly in American culture, um, not everyone does everything right. And of course, you know, this is still an issue today. Not every building project turns out as it should. There are often unforeseen problems. And the same problems that plague architects today plagued them 130 years ago. He also, of course, does not win many competitions. I mentioned earlier, he applied for the Georgia State Capitol. That was one of many. Um, he also did not win every competition in Michigan. He submits a design for the original DIA, the Museum of Art in Detroit. And despite his Detroit connections, he does not get this commission. So it is not as though everything he wants magically falls from the sky onto his plate. He does, however, get another capital commission in the 1880s for Colorado. Colorado, the centennial state that comes into the Union, I believe, in 1876. This, in some ways, Meyer's capitals show the westward growth of America and also the coming of age of states across the country. Because in most states, you can't instantly afford a big grand capital. You have to wait a few years, <laughs> put some money in the bank first. And so you have Michigan, then Texas, Idaho, Colorado, we're moving westward. We are, the, nice, the Victorians would have said, civilizing the country with these buildings. Now, in some ways, this building, is similar to Michigan and Texas. When I look at it, I also see the courthouses in Elyria and in Marion, particularly with the entrance that he designs here. Um, his court capitals are in some ways courthouses on steroids, but they're also works of art. Here you can see um, uh, one of the architectural renderings for the dome for the, the Colorado building. These are immensely complex structures. Things though, if they didn't go well in Texas, they went even worse in Colorado. Uh, Myers receives this commission. He is given a period of, I forget how many months, to prepare the plans for it. He submits the plans. The building commission looks at them and says, wonderful, thank you so much. Been a pleasure doing business, bye. By this point in time, Elijah Myers was getting a reputation that was not very good. And the Colorado newspapers make it abundantly clear. All we need are his plans. We do not need to pay him to commute out here for the next however many years. We do not need to deal with him. He can be rather difficult. All we need are his plans. And then per the contract, he has fulfilled his obligation. We have fulfilled ours. We have cut him a check and we can part ways and we can hire somebody local who's cheaper and easier to get along with to actually build it. In fact, there is a story printed in a Colorado newspaper at this time that is probably apocryphal, but is entertaining nonetheless, that actually references back to the Michigan build and a clash of egos that happened in Michigan. Now, personally speaking, I think this story is a complete and utter fabrication because I, I don't believe that something like this could have happened in Michigan without it appearing all over the Lansing press, if not the state press. 
But still, the story tells you something about Meyer's reputation by the mid to late 1880s. The story goes thus. Myers walks in to the governor's office one day as it is under construction. And there are a couple workmen in there framing in a closet. And he starts to yell at them because they're putting the closet on the wrong side of the room. He tells them, look at the plans. You're putting it over here. I want it over here. The, uh, the builders say, well, okay, but we were told to put it over here. Myers says, no, no, I'm the architect, do what I say. And walks the governor. The governor is going to move into this office and use it. And he goes over to the workmen who have now picked up their tools and moved to the other side of the room. And he says, hey, what are you doing? We just talked about this, guys. That, that closet needs to go over here. It'll be more convenient. And Myers draws himself up, looks at the governor and says, they need to listen to me. I'm the architect. I designed this. I told them to put the closet on this side. The governor says, perhaps you don't know who I am. This is the governor of Michigan. It's going to be my office. I want the closet over there, and they'll put it over there. Myers looks at him and says, really? Sure. You're the governor of Michigan. The people make governors, but God makes architects. And the closet went where Elijah Myers wanted it to go. Meyer's last really big, significant commission is for the Richmond, Virginia City Hall. Um, with this building, we can say without compunction that Meyer's literally crisscrossed the country. He designed buildings as far north as Michigan, as far, as far south as Texas, as far west as California, and as far east as Virginia. In some ways, this building is simply a larger version of the Knox County Courthouse and the Grand Rapids City Hall. It was the Richmond City Hall for many years. Um, eventually, city government moved out and it has been used for government offices, for state offices. It's just across the street from their uh, Thomas Jefferson State Capitol. Um, it has been used as private offices for lobbyists. When I was there a few years ago, um, it was um, mostly private use at the time, although I have a vague memory of um, reading an article about some government uh, spaces moving back in. When I went inside the building and had the chance to visit it myself, um, the moment where my, my breath caught in my throat um, was when I stepped onto the glass floor that you'll see here in the middle. Myers was not the only architect to design buildings with glass floors. Um, he did, of course, put one in the Michigan Capitol. Texas used to have glass in the middle of their rotunda floor as well. And today it would be easy to associate them simply with Myers. The truth is a lot of architects used glass floors in the 19th century to help move light through the buildings because he is designing in large part for a world that is still lit by gas. Light bulbs are available by the 1890s, but not every city um, has a, a, an electrical system. Um, so in some cases, we will continue to use gas in these buildings into the early 20th century. And there really is a, a, a technology evolution going on. Um, by this point in time, by the 1890s, 1900, more and more architects are starting to design using steel instead of iron. Meyer still prefers iron. Many of them by this point are starting to move more to the uh, classical uh, the neoclassical styles that the Columbian Exposition will, of course, make famous. And Myers will serve as the building inspector for the Columbian Exposition, as we know from his obituary, but he is not actually asked to design any buildings in it. He's good, but not that good. And to be frank, he is never embraced by the most powerful, fashionable East Coast architects of his era. He was not buddies with McKim, Mead, and White or H.H. H. Richardson, to say the least. Many of them looked down their noses at Myers as someone who chased after public work. We only design public buildings every now and then when they come to us. We prefer our clients to seek us out, not to chase work. <sighs> Elijah Myers saw no shame in chasing work. He wanted the best commissions he could get. And for him, that meant 
the biggest public buildings he could imagine. These are the buildings that are at the hearts of our communities, our courthouses, our city halls, our capitals. These buildings constructed in the Victorian period are at the hearts of our cities and towns to this day. They help form our, our collective consciousness as to what America looks like. And in that sense, they are priceless artifacts of history. That is not to say though, that they are all big and grand. After Richmond, Myers continues to retreat into smaller and smaller circles. Um, the construction of the, the city hall in Richmond drags on for years for a variety of issues. And ultimately by the mid to late 1890s, the early, early 20th century, Myers is basically back to designing again in Michigan, much more modest commissions like the Central United Methodist Church or the Central Methodist Episcopal Church as it was originally in downtown Lansing across from the Capitol. The Stockbridge Town Hall, which still stands to this day um, right on the town, the town square green. And his last building that we have identified, the Howell Carnegie Library, a beautiful facility still in use to this day. We believe this was probably Meyer's last commission. And as we know, his story ends on March 5th of 1909. By that time, he was uh, waging battles for his health. Um, he was uh, engulfed in a rather toxic lawsuit involving a failed attempt for a commission in Pennsylvania. Ultimately, that lawsuit would go all the way to the United States Supreme Court five years after his death when it would be settled in favor of his estate and his wife. As I said, Elijah Myers never backed down from a lawsuit. I don't think the man ever backs down from anything, but that doesn't mean he won all of his battles. He was, as I said earlier, in many ways, the epitome of the Gilded Age with all of its, <laughs> all of its warts, but also all of its beauty. He was not an easy man, but he was a great success. How though is he remembered today? Well, as I said earlier, he is remembered in large part for his capitals and in many communities for the buildings that survive, be they courthouses or churches. But the number of buildings that survive, that number grows smaller every few years. We estimate, and I say estimate in a very broad sense, that Myers designed well over a hundred, maybe two or 300 buildings, who knows? Um, as I said, there is no cache of his papers. As we have studied him, we have had to do it one building in one community and one newspaper word search at a time. And much of the research that this presentation is based on was done 10 plus years ago in what I now refer to as the freenewspapers.com era. So there is more work to be done. However, I can tell you that of his courthouses he designed, we believe there were a dozen, of those courthouses, there are now seven gone. And I know that's all too well because I was personally involved in a fight a few years ago to try to save number seven. It used to be six and six. Number seven, um, by this reckoning, was in a, a small town in Ohio by the name of Tiffin, in the seat of Seneca County, where ironically, uh, my ancestors lived in the Civil War era. I actually had ancestors who fought in the Civil War from Seneca and Miranda counties in Ohio. This building was open to great fanfare in the 1880s, but over the years, it was not terribly well maintained. And after the dome started to leak, it was removed and replaced with an Art Deco clock tower. The windows were replaced bit by bit the integrity of this building was lost. It didn't all happen at once. It never all happens at once. It happens one decision at a time. Sometimes those decisions are made because of finances. Sometimes they're made for expediency. Sometimes they're made out of evolving notions of taste. But in the end, they all add up. And 10 years ago, when there was serious, serious talk 
about whether or not this building was worth using anymore. Ultimately, the answer from the community, the answer from the local commission was no. And so one of what was then six Elijah Myers courthouses, works of America's greatest capital architect was demolished. Here you can see one of many photos that were taken by um, then friends of mine that I had made in the community as it came down. I told myself when word came that the building was going to be demolished, that it was only fair that I should go down and watch the process myself because I, I wanted to, to stand there side by side with the people I had come to know in the community and watch and document the history with them. Ultimately, I couldn't do it. I could not do it. So instead, I cried over the photographs that they sent me. And you might say, well, you're a sentimental historian. You cry over buildings. You're weird. Well, the truth is, I am weird. But these buildings are more than just sentimental Victorian remnants. These buildings are part of who we are as Americans. And they were built to represent what we believed would be our country. They were not intended to last for 20 or 30 years as many modern buildings are. These buildings were intended to be America's cathedrals, not in the religious sense, but in the sense that they would survive for centuries. Myers said this at the dedication of the old Grand Rapids City Hall, which opened in 1888 and was demolished less than a century later in 1969 after a massive, massive historic preservation battle. Myers in 1888 said this, they, the Board of Public Works have a friend, a silent but most potent friend that attests their integrity and the care which has characterized all of their acts in the construction of that building. That friend is the building itself. The building stands as a monument to their fidelity, to their close attention and watchful care in every detail of the construction of this building. When this board has passed away, that friend, this building, will speak to their children and their children's children in its silent grandeur of the fidelity to public trust of their parents and grandparents. They have builded for the future and have wrought successfully and established a great public structure which for generations will increase the beauty of this city and add materially to the convenience of its officials and citizens. Yes, Elijah Myers could be difficult. Yes, he was a salesman, but in some ways he was also a romantic. He believed as many men and women of his era did that these buildings would be part of America not just their America of the 19th century, but of the country that they were building brick by brick, stone by stone, column by column, one building at a time for generations to come after them. And in some places, we've done well by those buildings. I am extremely proud of the care that we take of our Michigan State Capitol. The building opened in 1879, it is now 100 and how many years old are we? A lot, <laughs> 42 years old now. Um, clearly math is not my strong suit, but we've had rough moments. In the 1960s, not the best era for historic preservation in, in America. We talked about tearing our capital down and replacing it. Now we didn't, thankfully, for a number of reasons, but we talked about it. And what would we have built instead? A glass box a metal steel box, not a capital, not a proper American capital, a classical building topped by a tall dome. And slowly, as we lose these buildings, I believe that we lose pieces of our, our communities and quite frankly, as ourselves. If I tell you tonight to close your eyes 
and picture an American Capitol or an American courthouse, you're going to picture, I dare say, exactly the kind of building that Elijah Myers designed. May we preserve his work and be, as he said, friends to those buildings. That building is our friend and serves us. Let us be its friends in turn and preserve these pieces of American history for more of those future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. That was wonderful. Thank you. It was fascinating. <laughs> Your passion was beautiful. Thank you. You're this welcome. A, a topic near and dear to my heart, as you can tell. Um, yeah. Someday I intend to dive back into that research and, and I, I hope to be able to, quite frankly, to write something on Myers someday, but that's many projects and years down the road. I, I, right. empathize, I empathize with you because I've seen what we do in the United States and then you go to Europe and France and the, uh, yeah, and the buildings are hundreds and hundreds of years old and they're still standing and mm -hmm. there are these beautiful buildings down. It breaks my heart as well. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. If there are any questions about Myers um, or about the presentation tonight, I'd be happy to try to answer those. I would be curious to know if anyone who's joining us tonight lives in any of these communities that have or had Myers buildings. We, of course, are lucky enough to have a couple in Lansing. We did have a question in the chat and um, one of the guests um, attending wants to know if you wouldn't mind providing contact Oh, sure, no, that's fine. Um, I'll just put my email in here. Um, and you can find me through the Capitol's website as well. Oh, very cool. My great grandfather was a stone architect for the Lansing Capitol. That's fantastic, Diana. Um, if you could send me an email actually to that address, I would love to um, talk to you and learn more about who he was and his work and see if we can track him down in our historical records. We do not have complete records for construction that give us the name of every single person who worked on the building, um, but we do know a fair number of them and anything more that we can learn from you would be fantastic. Okay, um, yeah, my cousin, uh, we went to the 1992 uh, dedication when after they remodeled it, and uh, his name was Richard Glaster, but I will send you oh, an email. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, Richard Glaster was an incredible man. Um, yes, his, his home still stands in downtown Lansing, actually, so I would love to talk to you more about him. Yep, I have Thank a picture so of it on Walnut Street. Uh-huh, yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I see another question. Do you think he had an attitude because he was trying to prove himself because of no college degree? I think he had an attitude because that's who he was. Um, to be frank, you couldn't have a college degree in America in architecture at this time. They didn't exist. Um, I, the only way to get university level education um, at this point in time was to go to Europe. And while there were a few American architects of his generation who did, um, it just, it was not feasible. I, I, as much as he had the money, he could have gone to Europe at some point in time. I have never actually found a brilliant enough window when he had time to make that journey. Um, so it could have been, I think that could have been maybe a factor that separated him from some of the really um, high class East Coast architects who did train in France. Um, uh, for example, Richardson did train at the, well, I'm not going to pronounce it because my French accent is awful, at the Beaux-Arts School, um, Nicole de Beaux-Arts, something like that. Um, but in general, I think it was just who he was. <laughs> and no disrespect to any architects on the call, um, but I think to some extent, you know, if one's going to literally spend one's life designing big grand buildings for other people to use, I think one has to have a certain amount of self-confidence, shall we say. Are there any other questions? 
Is there an online website you were talking, making reference to? So just the Capitol's website, which is very basic. Um, it's capital.michigan.gov. We do not have much up at this point in time about Capitol history, which is a shame. Someday, someday we'll get there. Um, the research that we've done on Myers and uh, a great deal of the research that we've done on men like Glacier um, lives in our internal um, archive that we have. Uh, we have both a ever-growing paper archive and also digital archives. So there are several things that we have collected over the years, but we've not yet been able to make them public online. Um, we're at the beginning of a, a project, actually a partnership with the Library of Michigan, where we are starting to put some of our postcards. Uh, we have a, a collection of several hundred postcards um, of the Capitol and Myers buildings and um, the buildings around Capitol Square that we are currently working with the library to the Library of Michigan to scan and to make available through their website. But the truth is, I'm a one woman show with the Capitol. Um, most of my coworkers spend the bulk of their day actually taking care of the building itself. So our technical abilities are pretty limited at this point in time. Never ask a historian to do tech stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And, and um, please, you know, if you have additional questions tonight, feel free to send me an email. Katie knows how to get a hold of me as well. Um, we would love to hear from you, certainly. And um, if you come across an Elijah Myers building I didn't mention tonight, let me know. As I said, the hunt continues and we never know what treasures might be out there um, just waiting to be rediscovered. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to Katie and the library for putting this together and sponsoring the talk. It's been a pleasure and I hope to um, chat with some of you more in the future. Thank you all for attending tonight and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Valerie. Good night.